Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is Salvation by Grace. And in this series, I've been emphasizing the cross, Jesus' death on the cross. It was a sacrificial death. It was an atonement for the sins of the world. In fact, the atonement. There is no other way in which we can atone for our sins because Jesus is the atonement. And what that means is that there's nothing we can do. We can't punish ourselves to try and make ourselves acceptable to God. And some people who are caught up in various religious ideas do that. They think that I have to suffer in order to pay for my sins. Well, there's no amount of suffering that you and I can go through that will pay for our sins because it's not a question of human suffering. It's a question of divine wrath. The Bible speaks as God's wrath as being his righteous reaction to sins. And the judgment of God means that his wrath will be outpoured. Now, if that wrath touches our life, then there can be no salvation. And the only possible way of being saved is if somebody else takes our place and that wrath is poured out upon them. And the Bible teaches us that Jesus did exactly that. He is the sin bearer. He is the atonement. And in today's program, we're going to see how Jesus is the fulfillment of the atonement. Now, when we talk about Jesus and his work on the Day of Atonement, the fulfillment of Leviticus 16, we find Jesus is our high priest. And his sacrificial blood fulfilled the sacrifices of the blood of bulls and goats. But unlike the Old Testament high priests, Christ, as the sinless priest, did not have to make sacrifice for his own sins. As the high priest entered the Holy of Holies with the blood of the sacrificial victim, so Jesus entered heaven to appear before the Father on behalf of his people. The high priest had to offer sin sacrifices every year, and this annual repetition served as an annual reminder that perfect atonement had not yet been given. But Jesus came through his own blood and eternally reconciled us to the Father, which means that Jesus died once for all. There is no need now any longer for any sacrifice. And any way in which we celebrate our communion service, any way in which we think about the Lord's table or communion that suggests that there is a living, an altar which is there and a sacrifice being placed upon it, freshly upon it, is against the understanding of Scripture. We don't need an altar anymore. There is only one altar, only one sacrifice. That has been made 2,000 years ago, and now there is no priest of ours on the earth. There is only a priest in heaven, and his name is Jesus, and he's carrying his blood in the Father's presence now, and ever living to make intercession for us. We find in the Old Testament the sin offerings could cleanse the sinner only ceremonially and outwardly. They could not cleanse the conscience. They could not cleanse the sinner internally. But through his better sacrifice, Jesus purged our conscience from dead works. The tabernacle was designed to teach Israel that sin hindered access to God's presence. Only the high priest, and he only once a year, actually two times on that one day, clutching sacrificial blood could enter the Holy of Holies. Jesus, however, could, through a new and living way, enter heaven, and he's still there now. We no longer need to stand away from God. Instead, through Christ, we can approach God face to face. On the Day of Atonement, the flesh of sin was burned outside the camp of Israel. Jesus also suffered outside the gates of Jerusalem to deal with his people's sin 
and unite them with God. So we see Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of everything the Old Testament speaks of when the Old Testament says, uses the word atonement. Now, remember I said earlier that atonement is reflected in a number of achievements that Jesus has gained for us upon the cross. And we come back to some of those word pictures I was mentioning earlier. Now, the Bible uses special words to describe four major aspects of this atonement process. And as I said earlier, many people consider these to be technical words, which refer to distinctive doctrines and so forth. But actually, they're not. They're just inspired metaphors using the language of the day. And we've got to get back into the original meaning to see the language of the day and what these words meant to understand what God has done for us at the cross. Let me say again, these are only word pictures. They're not, um, what shall we say, you, you, got, you can't press these pictures too far. A metaphor can't be carried too literally. So if we say, oh, for the wings of a dove that I might fly away, you won't expect me to literally sprout wings, you know, and fly away. It's a metaphor. And so we have to understand that this language is metaphoric language. The moment you try and press it too far, you get into all kinds of difficulty, as we will see it. But nevertheless, these words are beautiful and very real, and they give us a blessing as we understand what they reveal to us about what Jesus did on the cross. The first word, propitiation. That's probably the longest word we're going to come across. Propitiation, it is the Greek word hilasmos, and it's used as a metaphor for Christ's work. It's translated propitiation, and it's a word picture taken from the common, everyday, religious life of the Greek people. And what was this picture? What it was, the word propitiation, described the process by which the Greeks offered sacrifices to placate and to appease the anger of the gods. Now you can see straight away why we don't want to press this too far. It's only a picture. And so what he is saying, you can talk about your propitiation, you can talk about all of that, but we also have a propitiation, he says. And just as your sacrifices turn away, as far as you're concerned, the anger of your gods, so we've got a God who has made his own propitiation. That's basically what he is saying. Now, propitiation is clearly not an analogy, because neither testaments, neither the Old Testament and certainly not the New Testament, present God as an angry God whose affections need to be bought or who can be bribed into changing his mind. That's a pagan concept. And uh, he's neither angry like those pagan gods who just seem to be irritable as if they'd forgotten to have their breakfast or something like that. No, no. This is a metaphor which points to God's just wrath against sin and to God's provision of the substitute who willingly completed or exhausted or satisfied God's wrath. In Greek life, the people had to appease the angry gods with gifts for the gods did nothing. The people had to do it. The gods, they just sat there and were angry. And, and if there was a flood, sacrifice quickly, quick, get some. And we know what this is talking about because many of you from Africa know exactly this is the kind of lifestyle out of which you have been saved. This is the context right today in many different parts of the world with these animistic beliefs, offering sacrifices and so forth because there's sickness in the family or because something's happening, there's some tragedy hitting the village. Uh, but the important thing is you have to provide that sacrifice. Now, this is not the propitiation that we're talking about with God. God himself provided the sacrifice. His wrath and anger was just and righteous, and he provided the sacrifice for himself. And more than that, he himself, in the person of Christ, became the sacrifice. And so there's only one thing we get from this word picture, and that is that God is a God of love who sends a sacrifice to turn away his wrath that we might be reconciled to him. And so we need to see that God in his holy wrath has to be propitiated, but God in his holy love initiated that propitiation and that God in Christ died as the propitiation. Second word picture. Redemption. The word picture, apotrosis, apolo, apolotrosis rather, was taken from Greek business life, where it describes the process 
by which objects were properly purchased for a fixed price. It was also commonly used to describe the purchase, the ransom price, for slaves or prisoners of war. A slave could be set free by the payment of a price. And so the idea of this, it is you, you, you are set free by the payment of the price, and that means you belong to another master, another owner. Uh, and so the idea of redemption is used extensively in the Old Testament of purchasing property, animals, persons, and even of the Jewish nation. Look at Exodus chapter 13 and verse 13. For every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, and if you will not redeem it, then you'll break its neck, and all the firstborn man among you, you shall redeem. Second Samuel 7.23, Who is like your people, like Israel, the one nation on earth, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for himself a name, and to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land before your people, whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, the nation, and their gods. It's a perfect picture of redemption. In the Old Testament, the payment of the price is always the essence of redemption by humans. And where God is described as the redeemer, then the price always refers to the costly effort he makes. Exodus 6, verse 6. The effort is here. Say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord God. I will bring you out from under the burden of Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. So the cost there is the effort involved. The redemption in terms of objects, of people redeeming objects, there's a price always has to be paid. When God does it, he, the Old Testament picture builds up. The price is God's costly effort involved. And this climaxes in the New Testament with the redemption in Christ Jesus, with the payment price being the blood of Jesus, which sets us free. So redemption is a metaphor which points to the plight from which we are redeemed, the price with which we are redeemed, and the proprietary rights of the Redeemer. So it tells us that because we're redeemed, we belong to him, we are his property. And I'd rather be owned by Jesus than owned by the devil. Can I have an amen? amen. All right, just to make sure you're awake. Okay. The plight from which humanity has been redeemed, of course, is sin, the fall, and all its consequences. And we have been able to experience redemption since Calvary, but we are still waiting for the ultimate day of redemption when we will be made perfect and all creation will be limited, uh, liberated from its bondage to, de to decay. Until then, we have the earnest of our redemption, the guarantee of our final redemption, the Holy Spirit. And all the scriptures are there for you to look at. The New Testament makes it clear that it was Christ himself and particularly his blood, which was the price paid. But the metaphor is never pressed too far as to ask the question, who was the price paid to? So you see, it's, it's a metaphor. You can't press it too far. If you press it too far, you get into all kinds of complications. And as we saw in one of the earlier sessions, that's how some of the early church uh, went astray in trying to work out all those details, not understanding this was a picture. We had to take the central thrust of that picture and ask what it teaches us, about, teaches us about the atonement rather than to try to look at every detail and force the picture image too far. So the scripture also use, uses the redemption image to stress that the Redeemer has proprietary rights over the purchase. Jesus is Lord over the church and Lord over individual Christians because we have been bought by his blood. Now the third picture here is that of justification. This language is drawn from the law courts, where the word dikaio, to justify, was the precise opposite of to condemn. The Greek and Roman judges either pronounced somebody guilty or not guilty. They were either justified or condemned. And the term justification, therefore, illustrates God's action in declaring sinners flee, free from blame on the basis of the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ who exhausts the sinner's judgment. And it also has to do with God imputing Christ's righteousness to us so that they can stand, so that we can stand before God with Christ's righteousness. Justification is simply a first century illustration 
of God's official declaration of righteousness on the basis of his objective legal pardon. It is a, a legal pardon. God says you are justified, even though you are a guilty sinner. Because if you believe, then Christ's righteousness is given to you because he has already taken your sin upon himself. This is a change in legal status. It sheds no light and makes no reference to a change of nature. So when you stand in the dock and you're judged and God says you're justified, that hasn't changed your nature at all. That has changed your legal standing. But of course, God does go on to change your human nature through what we call regeneration and sanctification. Not only are you justified, but you are also born again. Now, when you're born again, God's Spirit comes to live on the inside of you and begins to change you, and He begins to sanctify you. But the picture of justification has nothing whatsoever to do with what's going on inside of you. It only relates to you receiving what Jesus has done by faith. And so... God's uh, uh, justification comes, therefore, by God's grace alone. It's entirely his initiative and his accomplishment. It comes through Christ's blood alone, being justified freely by his grace. Romans 5 verse 8, Now much more having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So when God justifies sinners, he is not declaring bad people good, or saying we are not sinners, instead he's pronouncing them legally righteous, officially not guilty, because he in Christ has borne the penalty of their law breaking. And it's received through faith alone. So it's God's grace alone, through Christ's blood alone, through Christ alone, and it was received through faith alone. This means that we must receive uh, what God has done for us and what grace offers entirely by faith. And we must depend entirely on what Christ has done for us. And so that's the only condition. That's the only condition for justification. Faith. Justification by faith. We are not justified by faith and works. We're justified by faith alone. And it's not enough to say, okay, all right, we're justified by faith, but if faith is real and it's really going to be active, then we should also be justified by faith, which is demonstrated in good works. That is confusing justification and sanctification. To say we're justified by faith means that the moment you believe in Jesus Christ to be your Savior, you are saved, and God declares you in that moment justified. And if God has declared you justified, there is nobody that can reverse that decision. Not even you, not even the devil. Nobody can reverse that decision. Let me put it to you this way. Try to understand this. I know time is running on. Justification refers properly to the day of judgment when God sits at jud as judge. And in that day which is yet to come, God will sit as judge on the great white throne and he will declare people either to be righteous or unrighteous. That's the day of judgment. Okay? Now, if Christ had not come, we would face God on that day as righteous judge and he would have to condemn us as unrighteous people because of our sins. But what Jesus did, now understand this, justification is an eschatological concept. That means it has to do with the day of judgment at the end. You got it? But what happened was this. Christ came into history and he says, I've got good news for you. I am going to accept your judgment now. And he reached out into the future, took hold of God's judgment, and God poured it upon him so that judgment day took place 2,000 years ago on the cross. And so that when we believe in Jesus, we enter into the benefits of his death, and for us, judgment day is over. We will not stand before God as judge 
to receive his justification or condemnation. All it will be on that day is, yes, you are justified, come in. Because that day of judgment has taken place forever already uh, 2,000 years ago when God has condemned sin in the person of Jesus Christ so that anyone who believes in Jesus Christ is free from that condemnation. Therefore, Paul says, sin, Paul says there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So we go to heaven knowing there's no condemnation. Amen? Of course, we're going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the rewards of uh, and, and there is judgment at that judgment seat concerning what we've done in our body. We will suffer loss if we have not served Jesus. If we have served him and honored him, we will be rewarded. And there is such a thing as possibly being saved as though by fire, in which your works are stripped away if they're not honorable works, and they are burned. You are saved, but as though through fire. Now that judgment is there. We are going to see that judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, but we're not going to stand before this judge of all the earth concerning our sins because those sins have been judged already. Now the old Reformation formula helpfully summarizes the biblical teaching on justification as by grace alone, through Christ alone, by faith alone. Which means that we are putting all our eggs into one basket. We're trusting in what Jesus has done for us and anything that we do for him is not the basis of our relationship with God. It doesn't get us into heaven, and neither does it assure us that we're going to heaven. What only thing assures us that we're going to heaven is the blood of Jesus that we receive by faith. Now, this justification is also corporate. It's not just something that's individualistic. God justifies his people, and there is this corporate dimension because we are justified together through the blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore we're to be in Ephesians 1 verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. So we must remember that we're called together to be his people. And then the fourth picture is the picture of reconciliation. And the Greek word here, katalasso, is taken from everyday Greek life. We're talking about the healing of two people who were at enmity with each other, an estrangement between two parties. It referred to old friends or relatives making up after an argument or a quarrel. And this talks about the yearning of God behind all his plan of salvation. The whole purpose of salvation is to reconcile us to himself so that we can live in eternal relationship with him. Now remember, the Bible does not teach that God needs to be reconciled to us. He loves us already. He's done nothing wrong against us. He, he, he's not harboring anything against us. Yes, his wrath needs to be turned away, but it's we who are at enmity with him. This speaks about our rebellious attitude, our rejection of God, our hatred of God. Reconciliation is God winning us back to himself. And at the cross, Jesus Christ brought us back to God and reconciled us to him. This is the purpose and the fruit of salvation. And so our salvation has to do with a new relationship that Jesus Christ has brought to us so that we can come to find peace with him. Now, this teaching shows us that God is the great author and initiator of reconciliation. We were against him. We had wanted nothing to do with him at all. But God loved us and drew us back. Christ is the agent. God has done this through Christ we are then also called to be ambassadors, to preach and to practice this reconciliation. And so now, we see the picture of atonement. These four word pictures from the first century are simple everyday expressions and illustrations of overarching aspects of the atonement. They can't be fitted together in some kind of neat theory of atonement, but they provide us with insights into everything that God has done for us, and we should look at these facets together to see the beautiful jewel of what we can call the atonement. But there's one or a number of things that hold these pictures together. Every single one of these pictures tells us, first of all, that humanity has a very great need. God's wrath needs to be propitiated. That salvation is all of God's grace. 
It's his love that has taken the initiative and affected salvation at every level. And it's been accomplished, number three, by the blood of Jesus Christ through his substitutionary, sacrificial death on the cross. And so the death of Jesus on the cross was the, as the substitute was the once-for-all single sacrifice of atonement because of which God averted his wrath from us and it was the ransom price by which we have been redeemed and it was the condemnation of the innocent by which the guilty might be justified so that we might be one with God, one with each other and ultimately one with all creation for all eternity. This is the sheer greatness of just a single aspect of our salvation. And there are three more that are to follow, which we'll consider in the following sections. Now, as we bring this, section, this session to a close, I wanted to encourage you, please, to go back over this material, look up the scriptures. And in the short 50 minutes that I have to share with you in each of these sessions, I don't have enough time to develop any of these points or to take you through the scriptures. And it's important that you use the full teaching in the manual to study, to look up the scriptures, and to apply it to your life so that you can be very, very sure about the basis of your salvation. And that really is the heart of why I have taken the time and trouble to write this uh, manual and also to present it to you in this way. Because I want you to be in the place with God where you are absolutely sure about your right standing before him. We speak so much about the condemnation of the devil in our lives. And we know that it's right to be under full conviction concerning our sins. And no one can come to Christ as Savior without first understanding their need of that salvation. So we need to be convicted of our sin, but at the same time, we need to be convicted of his righteousness, which is a free gift into our life forever. Just as I say, it's like this. My unworthiness is lost in the infinite sea of the worthiness of my Lord and my Savior, who redeemed me and purchased me for himself by his precious blood. And to all who believe in his name, the same is true. God bless you until we come together again for the next session. Salvation by grace, that's what we've been talking about. I certainly have been blessed as I've given this teaching today. And I pray that God will continue to bless you as you grow in the knowledge of his grace. And so until next time, God bless you.